The Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Jesus said to the disciples, You have heard it said to those of ancient times, You shall not murder, and whoever murders shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that if you are angry with a brother or sister, you will be liable to judgment. And if you insult a brother or sister, you will be liable to the council. And if you say, You fool, you will be liable to the hell of fire. So when you're offering your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go. Be reconciled first to your brother or sister, and then come offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are on the way to court with him, or your accuser may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard, and you will be thrown into prison. Truly, I tell you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. You have heard that it was said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one of your members than for your whole body to go into hell. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that anyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of unchastity, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of ancient times, you shall not swear falsely, but carry out the vows you have made to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by earth, for it is, foot, it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, for you cannot make one hair black or white. Let your word be yes, yes, or no, no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. The gospel of the Lord. Congregation may be seated. Please pray with me. O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of each heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, you who are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. I want to start really briefly with our message from Corinthians today, and then I'll move to the gospel. Paul writes to the Corinthians because they are quarreling with each other. His first letter to the Corinthians is to help them learn how to get along and stop fighting with each other. And in this letter, Paul calls for reconciliation. The whole thing is written to remind the people about what it means to follow God and not just these human leaders, but to remember that the point is really to serve God and not these leaders. So then, as Paul calls us to reconciliation, we move to today's gospel. And at first glance, it feels like a pretty sharp statement about laws and rules. But it also makes a statement about reconciliation. We're told if you have a quarrel with your brother or sister, go make peace with them. Jesus says rather than going to the altar with your gift that you're supposed to sacrifice for the Lord to make things right, go first to that person. So God is concerned about us reconciling with our neighbor and then coming to God for reconciliation. Leave your treasure at the altar and seek restoration of that relationship with them before coming to God. And actually, that's why we have the sharing of the peace as part of our worship service in the Lutheran um, and in liturgical congregations. Before we come up for communion to share a meal, we are to go to our brother or sister right before the offering, leave our treasure there, and make peace with those that we need to make peace with and then offer our gifts, and then come be reconciled in communion. <clears throat> this is not fulfilling just the law, but it's going beyond to a higher purpose. I'm um, actually sorry, let me, t let me say something else first. When we seek reconciliation, we're going beyond the law to fulfill a higher purpose, not just doing the thing, right? Not just stop poking, but we're going beyond that to restore the relationship and be at peace with the other person again. 
And in fact, this section of the Sermon on the Mount is entitled, Jesus Alters the Law, at least in the NRSV it is. So what often may feel like Jesus raising the bar of expectations on what we do and what we don't do with the commandments, it's really about Jesus reminding the people of the higher purpose of the law, living in peace, with compassion, building trust and reconciliation, rather than just those literal words of the law, like we had in our children's sermon. So this is what Jesus means when he alters the commandments. He tells us, do not murder, do not commit adultery, do not swear by the Lord's name, but he asks us to look beyond these things and do more than just that. He wants us to go deeper. He often gets in trouble for breaking the law, like healing on the Sabbath, but this time he tells us to fulfill it with more detail and expectation. He says, do not murder, and murder, as we know, is killing someone. But Jesus says, also, don't just not kill their body, their physical self, but don't kill their trust, their spirit, or your relationship with them, with your anger, or your harsh words. And when you mess up or you break trust because you've hurt them, go and reconcile. Fix it, or at least try. He also reminds us about do not commit adultery. But he says, not only should you remain physically faithful to the person you have committed to, but you're to remain faithful to them with your thoughts of them and with the way that you think about others. And then that brings Jesus to kind of a special aside about divorce. And I think he brings in two important things with this very short piece of this whole passage. First, at that time, the law said you must give your wife a certificate of divorce, otherwise you weren't technically divorced. Now, as you might remember, men were the only ones that could offer to, to ask for a divorce. The women, you were stuck. If you, if you didn't feel uh, comfortable or you were being abused or whatever, you had to stay. But the man could give a certificate of divorce. And if he didn't, you weren't technically divorced. So if you were no longer in a man's ownership or care because he left, left you but didn't give you a certificate, that you had no place to go and you couldn't marry again because you weren't technically divorced. And if you did, then you were committing adultery and you were causing someone else to commit adultery. So Jesus says it's important that you do this the right way. But then also, Jesus calls them to an even bigger look. He says, don't just marry and divorce willy-nilly. Like, you can give your, your wife a certificate of divorce, but don't just do it to do it. Like, I wanted, to, I wanted to be physical with you, and so we did, and I got married to you, and now I'm saying forget it. But he's saying to remain faithful to that person and not break their trust. Don't commit adultery. And adultery is really all about trust and faithfulness. When the law was created, you could have more than one wife. So the way that the men got away with that is they could um, decide that they wanted another wife, and then they would have physical relationship, and then they would pay a little money to the family, and they would have another wife. But they didn't want them to just dismiss them quickly then when they did that. This aside on divorce is not so much about divorce being right or wrong, but it's about commitment and relationship and faithfulness and trust. And it speaks to the care and thoughtfulness of a person within their marriage. Finally, the law says, don't swear falsely. In other words, don't use the Lord's name in vain um, to, to swear or be dishonest. Don't swear without following through. But here today, Jesus says you shouldn't even need to swear at all. Your word should be so honest and true and mean so much to you that when you say yes, people know that you mean yes, or when you say no, people know that you mean no. Jesus calls us to be honest with people so that we don't need to swear. So Jesus reminds us again to use the law to build faithfulness and commitment and relationship and reconcile when we mess up. But it's messy, right? These extra parts that Jesus adds here, it gets a little messy 
Because how do we know when just the law is right or wrong or when it's more than? When, how do we figure that out? And that's where this whole idea of the spirit of the law comes in when we think about using compassion and building this trust and commitment and relationship. For instance, we're human, and sometimes we say things that hurt each other. Jesus tells us not to do that, but sometimes we do. And so the point is then to go and reconcile. And of course, we're human. We're physical beings. And so sometimes we look at someone else and we say, wow, they're an attractive person. And that's not bad, but it's, okay, but it's not okay to be so consumed with thoughts of other people that you forget who you've committed to and that they are supposed to be the most beautiful person in your entire life. And we should not break trust or faithfulness when we don't follow our vows. Because not only is adultery a breaking of trust, there's another way that we break trust when we don't follow through on what we've promised. And divorce isn't simply about changing your mind either. We are called to be known for our honesty without having to swear and to live that all the time, but we forget. We forget our promises. We change our minds. Sometimes we say one thing to make peace and then do another. So it's complicated, but there's good news in this. When Jesus tells us he's come to fulfill the law, as we heard last week in the gospel, he tells us he's come to remind us of the love and the trust and the compassion that the law was set to bring about. Jesus doesn't come to make the law harder. He doesn't come to say it doesn't matter. Jesus comes to help us show love and compassion to each other to, through trust. And Jesus knows that we aren't perfect at this all the time. So he gives himself to us as an act of complete compassion and reconciliation. He dies for us. When we break that trust, reconciliation works to bring it back. After we share the peace every Sunday and, and our offerings, we come to the table and we eat a meal and the words we use are in remembrance of. And in remembrance of what God has done isn't just about remembering, oh yeah, Jesus really did that for us and that was awesome. It's about remembering or bringing the body back together, reconciling everyone to each other. This is what reconciliation is all about. And each week we do this. And Jesus calls us to do this with each other, not just with God. But even then, when we can't reconcile well with each other, Jesus always points us back to God. Jesus makes reconciliation ultimately possible. And so knowing that, therefore, the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.